Welcome to Democracy Dialogues, a conversation we need to be having now about the state of democracy in the Americas. I'm Eric Farnsworth, your series host. Our guest today is Miriam Cornblith, for 17 years the Senior Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the National Endowment for Democracy. Originally from Venezuela, Miriam has taught politics at the Central University of Venezuela. In the late 1990s, she served as a board member and vice president of Venezuela's National Electoral Council. Miriam is a keen observer of democratic trends and topics. She is one of the most respected democracy advocates and practitioners in Washington and, if I may say, across the wider Americas. Miriam Cornblith, what a pleasure it is to welcome you to the Council of the Americas for Democracy Dialogues. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Nicaragua, Haiti, <laughs> Peru, Brazil, Bolivia, Mexico, Cuba. The list goes on, but let's start with Venezuela. <laughs> yeah. What's the current state of play in that troubled country, and is there a path back to democracy there? <laughs> Deep breath. <laughs> yeah, indeed, for all yes. of us. <laughs> yes. Um, well, as you said, Venezuela is a very troubled country. The path is not clear. I mean, the opposition is really trying hard right now. They're working on uh, getting their act together to put a, 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 a thorough, a strong uh, primaries in, in order to select the candidate for the upcoming election. Venezuela is scheduled to hold presidential elections in 2024. That can be an opportunity and that's how democratic uh, forces are looking at the upcoming uh, election. But as we all know, this is a regime that has distorted all the, uh, all the uh, say, the democratic institutions, processes, uh, has uh, really weakened democratic players. Uh, their ability to distort the electoral process is, is really high. However, there's also a strong uh, interest among political players, also, I wouldn't say as strong as usual, but also a, a, an interest in the population to be able to participate in an election. And I guess, I mean, as Globally, uh, elections can also be shaped and changed and turned into opportunities in this kind of regime. So the main bet is to turn and to transform this upcoming election in an opportunity to mobilize the population, to highlight the grievances and the needs of the people, and to find uh, you know, uh, opportunities and a democratic space for those who are really uh, aspiring to live in a much better order <laughs> than the current state of affairs in Venezuela. You've been a, a practitioner in Venezuela in the actual electoral process. So you've seen the inner workings uh, of the machine, if you want to put it that way. To get to this place of a free and fair election where the people of Venezuela have a, an actual choice, what would have to take place at a minimum uh, and is that realistic in the current environment? Yeah, uh, just a disclaimer, I was an um, active practitioner like 20 years ago. I know and that. actually, well, it's closer I was than the, I. Yeah, <laughs> I was the vice president of the Electoral uh, Council when Chavez won for the first time. So yeah. things have changed dramatically sure. since then. Uh, however, I mean, there are some basic uh, aspects of uh, any electoral process. I mean, the backbone of an electoral process are the voters. And that means the ability of the voters to exercise their right. Mm -hmm. Right now in Venezuela, that ability is, uh, is uh, severely hampered. I mean, the uh, voter registration is really, uh, un is underrepresents the amount of voters that can actually exercise their vote. There hasn't been an open, real, uh, systematic campaign to allow voters to register, mainly young voters. Uh, Venezuela has also suffered uh, from dual, uh, say, massive uh, population mobilizations. On the one hand, 7.5 million Venezuelans are now living abroad. 7.5 million. That's, that's I mean, those are the estimates that, yeah. you know, maybe it's even more. Yeah. But um, uh, that's um, more than 20% of the population. 
In addition to that, there has been a severe, uh, a a significant mobilization, uh, um, internal mobilization of population, looking for better conditions of living, which means that from the most, say, uh, rural or, uh, say, uh, secluded areas, people are, are moving into the capital cities or from the capital cities and in, in the interior to Caracas. And all of that needs to be documented and all of the, uh, that needs to be registered in the voter registration uh, you know, system. And uh, not, not all of that. I mean, uh, a significant portion of all those, those m uh, movements have not been registered. So you find many voters who are now living, say, in Caracas that are still registered to vote somewhere in the interior. And a dramatic situation is that uh, despite the fact that so many Venezuelans are living abroad, the re voter registration list of Venezuelans living abroad is only 107,000 mm. pe uh, 107, people. So in <laughs> when I was at the, at, the, uh, at the CNE for the first w time, Venezuelans had the right to vote while living abroad. So it was my own, my responsibility because I was the head of the voter registration, say, division inside the CNE, and we opened the pos possibility because that was, uh, that was enshrined in the law. And at that point, <coughs> we managed to register like 10,000 Venezuelans, <coughs> excuse me, because I mean, very few lived abroad. This was very new. And can you imagine that in 20 plus years with the amount of Venezuelans living abroad, uh, it, it, you know, expanded in such high volumes, the increase has been less than 100,000 in 20 plus years. Mm. So those are severe deficits in terms of, uh, of uh, holding a free, fair, and competitive, transparent election. That's one issue. Then uh, the association between voters and their uh, polling station. Mm -hmm. And that has been distorted because of all of this uh, situation. So that those, those elements, which are the backbone of of an electoral uh, process are severely uh, distorted. If there's, a, you know, will in the current council, it could be addressed in a significant fashion. I wouldn't say solved 100 percent, but it could be and could, you know, mean a, 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 a serious improvement. But we haven't seen, seen that will yet. So I mean, that's why many organizations in Venezuela, especially young, uh, led by youth, are pressing for uh, more opportunities to register, mm -hmm. to vote, to and and also uh, organizations in in the diaspora are also pressing for that. Then there are a number of other aspects which uh, are you know directly related to the neutrality of the Electoral yes. Council. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, unfortunately, has been totally distorted mm -hmm. uh, right in, in Venezuela. Uh, at some point, there were no uh, members of the Electoral Council that had any connection or any, any ability to represent the opposition. Right now, uh, from a, a, a total of, of uh, five, at least there are two that can have some c that are connected to opposition, but of course they are m a minority. So basic decisions are still very uh, controlled by the will of the majority in the, in the CNE, which in turn represents the will of the government. So it is not an independent body, and mm -hmm. that's something that has uh, also curtailed severely the ability of holding free and fair elections. However, I mean, this may sound, you know, kind of uh, pessimistic or deterministic. I mean, nothing can be done in these conditions. However, I mean, things can, can be done. I mean, the, the, the situation of the electoral uh, sphere in Venezuela has degraded significantly. However, the opposition managed to, won, uh, to win, excuse me, to win the elections in 2015. Those were for the National Assembly, a very mm -hmm. significant uh, victory. Even before that, a uh, referendum to, cha to change the Constitution in 2007, the opposition won. So recently in the regional elections, the opposition won in Barinas, which mm -hmm. is the stronghold of the, of the, of Chavismo. the of yeah. Chavismo. Yeah. That's yeah. where Chavez was born. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities. But of mm -hmm. course, I mean, the opportunities 
need to have at least two, <laughs> two conditions. On the one hand, the will of those who, who run the whole operation to really open to to be open to enshrining the basic tenets of a mm -hmm. democratic process, and on the other hand, the willingness and the ability of the opposition to turn this into an, uh, an opportunity and seize, seize the moment and mobilize the, the population and, and turn the electoral process into a, a, you know, a, a, a f important moment of citizen mobilization and action and oversight of the electoral process. So, I mean, <laughs> To be seen. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. No, thank you for going through that. I mean, I think these are some fundamental issues, and it's why I'm particularly excited to have you here because you have, yes, it's been a while since you were in those positions, but you have lived this procedurally and you understand the importance of voter registration rolls that many people in Washington we just overlook. We say, well, why doesn't democracy come to a country? I mean, it is hard work to get to democracy and to keep democracy, and I think you've explained that very, very well. It really depends a lot, does it not, on the negotiations uh, that are on again, off again in Mexico in terms of do we get to conditions that could credibly be called free and fair for elections in Venezuela in 2024. Presumably, uh, the Maduro regime understands all the things you've been talking about and doesn't have the will to uh, ensure free and fair elections, if I can put it that way. What could the negotiators in Mexico or what should they be pushing for as in the first instance? What should be the priority issues? I mean, you can't solve all the issues and that's not realistic anyway, but are there one or two things that if you could agree in the, in the negotiation table in Mexico that could make a fundamental difference and begin a process or, or continue a, a process perhaps toward democracy in the country? Yeah, well, you know, what? in the last elections, the European Union yeah. had a, a, a mission, I mean, mm -hmm. sent a mission to observe the elections, and they described, I think, pretty well the main issues, and I think there is a, there is a, a roadmap. A roadmap. Sorts, yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, it's yeah. not, and it's not, again, it's not rocket science, it's mm -hmm. basically what uh, any, you know, basically a free and fair competitive election uh, should, uh, should have. Uh, some things that seem kind of ridiculous but are basic in nowadays in Venezuela is the electoral schedule. Yes. I mean, it, it has become a matter of utmost discretionary uh, decision making mm -hmm. whereby elections uh, like the last the presidential election took place in May, you know, <laughs> May of the year before, <laughs> prior to uh, taking office when elections usually take place in December and uh, the new government takes office in the, the next uh, mm -hmm. January. Mm -hmm. Things like that, like establishing very clearly the day when elections will take place, ensuring that day is uh, feasible mm -hmm. for both opposition and government parties to uh, hold their primaries, uh, carry out a campaign. Then there's the issue of resources. I mean, we all know how that Venezuela, the, the, one of the main characteristics of these 20 plus years in Venezuela has been the abusive and discretionary use of public resources yes. yep. in the hands of the government mm -hmm. for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. And this applies to every sphere, uh, including uh, enrichment of those who are in mm -hmm. office, but it also implies in a, in a very significant way uh, using those res resources to benefit the, the, uh, pol the politicians Absolutely. associated yeah. with the government to, uh, to fund their campaigns, their political campaigns, and with a evident disadvantage for the opposition. So there's no free and fair uh, electoral, uh, say, uh, playing ground when all the resources are in the hands of, the, of one of the players, which is the government. And that is not only uh, fiscal resources, which is obviously very significant, but it's also ability to air propaganda, yes. publicity mm -hmm. in the media, which the media is controlled by the government. It's also uh, mobilizing citizens, using, uh, mm -hmm offering goods and services in exchange for voting. I mean, there are very significant instances of vote buying. So, I mean, uh, a, a level playing field includes, uh, a, say, competitive and mm -hmm. fair use of 
resources. I mean, fiscal, monies, uh, infrastructure, media, ability to communicate. So that's, an, uh, that's a, obviously a, a very strong precondition for a fair, free and fair election. And um, there's, so I mean, s agreement in regards to the use of resources mm -hmm. and, that, and that's, I mean, so one aspect is a clear electoral schedule that does not benefit one part or the other, but it is a neutral uh, schedule yes. uh, following what is established in the Constitution and the electoral law, then uh, agreement in terms of uh, management of resources. And I think another very important uh, aspect is to, uh, to uh, not exercise uh, harassment and pressure on voters, which is something that has also distorted significantly the electoral process in Venezuela. Absolutely. But because of all the reasons I've, I've you know, ex exposed, I mean, the, the voters left, uh, you know, as a subject of pressure, basically, from the government that can uh, say trade the vote in exchange for goods, services, uh, you know, and, or in exchange for harassment, pressure, and so that's that's another very important condition. I mean, to agree on those basic rules, I think, is something that that is you, very necessary. But uh, the 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 say the opposition or the democratic platform has uh, s has detailed the main <laughs> conditions, especially based on what the European. Uh, uh, mission has already reported on what mm -hmm. needs to be changed in order to have an election that meets some, you know, uh, the, the basic, the uh, basic, inter yeah, yeah, basic international yeah. standards. My fear and the fear of many observers is that indeed that won't occur and then there's no particular plan B or parallel effort to try to bring democracy somehow to, to the country. But let me shift focus just a little bit. Democracy in Venezuela is an issue itself, but the situation in Venezuela is also impacting democracy in neighboring countries, isn't it? I mean, you've talked about over seven million, seven and a half million, uh, you know, displaced leaving Venezuela. They have to go somewhere, uh, and many are coming to the United States, but many more are in Colombia, Brazil, etc. How is the uh, collapse of Venezuela, politically, economically, all these things, how is that affecting regional democracy? Is it having an impact on democracy, or is it just a humanitarian issue? Not just, it's a huge issue, but I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying. Is it, are there political implications here as well, or is it primarily a humanitarian issue? How do you, how should we be thinking about this from a democracy perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge challenge. Yeah. And uh, well, I just came back from, from Colombia. I was there like two weeks ago. Colombia has hosted almost 2.5 million Venezuelans, mm -hmm. and maybe even more. I mean, among those, there are Colombo Venezuelans because I mean, yeah. there's a lot of uh, you know mobility, and there's a very tight, close uh, historic relationship between Venezuela and Colombia. So there are families that are Colombo Venezuelan, but right now, Venezuela, Colombia has uh, is has received two po at least 2.5 uh, Venezuelans, <coughs> which is very impressive. <coughs> Overall, that has strained uh, com Colombian institutions, especially uh, institutions that provide basic ser uh, you know, social services. However, we have to praise Colombia in the sense that mm -hmm. they have been really uh, generous in terms mm -hmm. of uh, hosting Venezuelans, providing to their best ability uh, basic uh, you know, services, schooling, uh, uh, housing, uh, Health mm -hmm. services, They're, they have uh, regularized uh, the, the presence of Venezuelans in, in Colombia. They have a, 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 a you know a lawful status there, so all of those issues are really important. And I think that has had an impact on on Colombia's uh, democracy in the sense of, for example, I think something that's very interesting that in several electoral processes, the main Colombian uh, parties have agreed. To n to not politicize yes, the yes. migration it's issue, very important. which is very mm -hmm. important, and it, I think it sends it sets a, a, a very interesting standard mm -hmm. and 
and precedent for countries around the world, mm -hmm. including the U.S., mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, uh, Western European countries, whereby uh, the immigra immigration uh, issue has become part of the political debate, Absolutely. the political division, the mm -hmm. polarization. I think it, even though, of course, there are issues and, and it is not devoid from polarizing conversations in Colombia, basically there has been a, I would say, a pretty principled and institutional approach. And I think that strengthens democracy and, and provides like a framework for mm. other countries in the region and beyond to address this issue. And also, I mean, when I have had conversations with some, uh, you know, public authorities in Colombia and I asked them, how, why, why did you choose this approach? And they, you know, the response is kind of, well, this is what we need to do. This is the right thing to do. This is the principled approach. And on the other hand, uh, and there was a time in the 70s, the 80s, and even earlier when there were significant number of Colombians uh, yeah. you know, fleeing the country because of the internal conflict that went to Venezuela. So mm -hmm. somehow there is some <laughs> reciprocity there. Yeah. Um, so uh, I mean that's I think that's a, a that's a very relevant case to to look at, but it's not been the same response in, uh, in the rest of the region. Some I think uh, in other cases the response has been less generous or has been you know more contentious. But right now there are like 2.5 million in Venezuela in Colombia, uh, close to a million Venezuelans in Peru, uh, half a million in, in Brazil. Uh, I, I mean significant, yeah. sing very significant numbers, and that has, it is strain, straining institutions and the debate and, and, and everything in, in, in those countries, and I think that's one of the reasons that at some point the, the, the governments and the civil society in uh, all these countries have looked at the Venezuelan crisis, and, it, and the Venezuelan crisis has become a matter of uh, public debate, electoral mm -hmm. debate, and you see m m very often people saying, we don't want to be like Venezuela, yes. we don't want the country yeah. to become a Venezuela, and it has been used, I mean, for the good and for the bad, but it has been used as a, the negative role model, the mm -hmm. negative model that nobody wants to fo follow. Mm -hmm. So I think it has had that kind of uh, implication as well. We're here with Miriam Kornblith, who leads the efforts at the National Endowment for Democracy on Latin America and the Caribbean here at Democracy Dialogues. Let's broaden the aperture a little bit, Miriam, if we can. Uh, at the beginning of this century, democracy advocates, we were feeling pretty good about democracy in, in the Western Hemisphere, no? Uh, we showed maps with only one country, Cuba, is not democratic. The rest were perhaps young and maybe troubled, but were still democratic in, in nature. Uh, things have changed uh, in 20 years. Uh, what happened to bring the democratic project into the, in, in the Americas into uh, the state of play that it currently is? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's uh, sad. Yeah. It's lamentable. I mean, we, yeah, as you say, we were very hopeful and proud about mm -hmm. democracy. And, and justifiably and so. There was a lot of work that went into that. Yes, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, but you know, for Venezuelans, the, the case started at the very beginning of the century. You know, just yes, after yes. Chavez was elected, I yeah. mean, the the non-democratic, uh, say, leanings were all already evident. But I mean, it took a while until they really developed, they fully developed. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, we all, we all <laughs> we're all trying to figure out what's what happened. Uh, and um, well, I don't know. I, I guess uh, there are several issues. I mean, some are related to structural. Difficulties. I mean, the real. This is something that everybody says, but it's worth, mm -hmm. you know, insisting. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The region continues to be the less, the the more, uh, say, uh, unequal mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, globally, and that mm -hmm. has a, a huge income disparities as uh, remain yes. wider in Latin America than anywhere yes, else. Yes, than yeah. anywhere mm -hmm. else, and and there have been significant uh, efforts mm -hmm. to to uh, expand uh, access to income uh, opportunities, especially uh, during the the commodity boom yeah. uh, you know, uh, moments. But that that remains an issue. I think on the other hand, uh, there was I guess maybe a naive expectation that with the 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 say the consolidation of democracies in the region the the authoritarian 
players would just back off, go, go away, go, away, <laughs> go home, and yes. just, you know. <laughs> the end of history. <laughs> yeah, the rest, you know, and that's not the case. They, are, they, the, the, those who had our authoritarian leanings continued to work in regards to pushing their agenda, mm -hmm. uh, becoming. Well, I want to, I think this is a really important point that you're raising, and I want to tighten it up just a little bit, because since the beginning of the century, we've seen new tools that people, authoritarians in particular, but everybody has access to and can use. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of social media, for example, or you know, uh, state-sponsored media uh, that didn't exist before Telesur or you know, RT for Russia, et cetera, et cetera. The National Endowment has done some really important work on sharp power, uh, and the Americas, I believe, has really been impacted by that. But maybe that's just an overreaction. Latin America is a huge user of social media. Do you assign any of uh, these challenges to the advent of social media, or is that just a kind of a neutral tool and doesn't really matter that much, and you know, democracy, the challenges are deeper and different anyway? Or is this something that is really contributing to the democratic breakdown? I think many people in the United States would suggest that it's contributing to polarization here. Presumably, it's the same in Latin America and the Caribbean, no? Yeah, indeed. I have yeah. no doubt about yeah. it. I mean, yeah, uh, again, as you said, it could be used as a neutral tool. Everybody mm -hmm. uses it, and it, it is. It, it can be super successful, useful to mobilize citizens, to connect citizens yes. with, the, with, their, with their, you know, their elected officials, to generate all sorts of innovative ways of m mobilizing, uh, interacting, and it has a huge democratic democratizing uh, potential. Mm -hmm. However, it seems that uh, non-democratic forces have taken the lead in using mm -hmm. social media to control the populations, yes. to instill uh, falsehood, to uh, distort reality, to steer uh, polarization, and uh, that has had a very significant impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, indeed. <coughs> it, it exacerbates the failings and yes. the difficulties yeah. uh, that, uh, that already exist and has the very deleterious uh, impact of uh, dividing mm -hmm. people. I mean, mm -hmm. because of the, the, the business model uh, intrinsic to social media uh, emphasizes polarization, yes. Uh, yes. it, it uh, say emphasizes, um, say, the silos, and bubbles whereby people just listen and, mm -hmm. and interact to, with uh, those that are similar to, to them. Mm -hmm. So that has uh, increased this, this, uh, this gap uh, between diff different sectors of society. And I think one of the, say, of the, of the main tenets of democracy is the ability of the democratic path and the democratic way is to allow for the differences to find a common ground, Absolutely. to build consensus, yeah. to bring to the fore like the different perspectives and find something that unifies them. But if we have a situation whereby there are differences which are le legitimate, but are being exacerbated and are being uh, presented as uh, unnegotiable, un uncompromisable, yes. I mean, that really undermines democracy in a very fundamental way. Because again, I think democracy, one of the, the beauties of democracy and one of the values of democracies is exactly the ability to bring together people mm -hmm. from very different uh, mm -hmm. views, sides, uh, ideologies, socioeconomic realms, and uh, uh, imperiling that ability and, and uh, severely uh, er eroding that ability uh, really uh, affects the heart of democracy, and I think that's happening obviously in Latin America, but not only there. I mean, this is a profound discussion. I, I think it's really, uh, the, the framing that you've just given, I think, is really, really important and very powerful in the short time that we have remaining. We only have a couple minutes, but let's speculate forward. Are we condemned now because of the reality of where we are in the information space? to continue to have troubled democracies and dem democratic challenges and weakening? Or is this, just as a trend has been perhaps downward since the beginning of the century, can we recapture 
an upward trend in dem democracy in the Western Hemisphere, maybe not for every country, but for the majority of countries and the majority of people. And if so, how, how do we do that? I mean, it's, it's a, obviously a challenge for the U.S., it's a challenge for Canada, it's a challenge for many other countries around the world, no question. So Latin America is not immune, but how do we somehow recapture a, a, a forward momentum on these issues? Yeah, well, you know, human rights, human, human, humans mm -hmm. are not condemned, you know. <laughs> yeah. We all, we have will, we yes, have the yeah, abili yeah. ability to overcome difficulties, mm -hmm. and we have, the, you have, we have awareness, and I think there's a growing awareness and a growing preoccupation about these, these uh, issues and these matters. Uh, I mean, in my role at the, at the National Endowment for Democracy, we see more and more civil society organizations, yes. and uh, you know, and also the, the multilateral organizations, the multilateral bodies who are concerned about this, are trying to to address the issue, are trying to counter this this trends, uh, are trying to influence this uh, business model that pervasively provokes uh, polarization. It is it is very difficult. That I'm not. I don't see this reversing. You know, in, in a couple of months. Mm. But there is. I think there is a, a significant effort to, ad to to address these uh, challenges and to find solutions that will allow for using social media with all its potential, but also uh, say um, pushing back on all this. Uh, you know, negative uh, consequences. Um, well, <laughs> what yeah, can so I say? Well, it's a <laughs> it's, it's but, we, but we end on a relatively <laughs> optimistic note. Yeah, uh, and, and people are exercising mm -hmm. their will, yes. their power, their knowledge, their awareness, and I think that's that's the you know we we have to trust on on people's desire to live in, in a better in, you know Absolutely. with dignity and, and uh, under uh, a democratic uh, regime with uh, you know uh, with. Uh, protection of human rights, so mm -hmm. there, I think there are serious efforts in that respect. I hope you'll come back to join us again at uh, Democracy Dialogues. This has been a terrific conversation, and I feel we've only scratched the surface in several areas. There's so much more to discuss. Regrettably, our time is uh, expired, but uh, Miriam, I want to thank you for joining us, and I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, here at the Democracy Dialogues for the wonderful uh, conversation that you've just been uh, exposed to. I hope you join us every month as we bring to you the most pressing issues on democracy in the Americas with the top advocates, analysts, and advisors from across the region. Together, we really can work to ensure that democracy delivers for all of us. Until next month for the Democracy Dialogues, this is Eric Farnsworth wishing you a very good day.